four chapters. It was the evening of February 2nd, 1943, and the U.S. 18th Dorchester was crowded to capacity, carrying 900 food servicemen, merchant seamen, and civilian workers. The Dorchester was only 150 miles from its destination, but the captain ordered men to sleep in their clothing and keep their life jackets on, and the soldiers sleeping deep in the ship's hold disregarded the order because the ships of because the engine's heat. Others ignored it because the of life jackets were uncomfortable. On February 3rd, at 12.55 a.m., a periscope broke the chilly Atlantic waters. Through the crosshairs, an officer aboard the German submarine, submarine U-223 spotted the Dorchester. After identifying and targeting the ship, he gave orders to fire the torpedoes. The hit was decisive and deadly, striking the starboard side amid the ship, far below the waterline. Aboard the Dorchester, panic and chaos had set in. The blast had killed scores of men, and many more were seriously wounded. Others stunned by the explosion were broken into darkness. Those sleeping without clothing rushed topside, where they were confronted first by a blast of icy Arctic air, and then by the knowledge that death awaited. Through pandemonium, and according to those present, four army chaplains brought hope to despair and light and darkness. Those chaplains were Lieutenant George L. Fox, a Methodist, Lieutenant Alexander D. Good, Jewish, Lieutenant John P. Washington, Roman Catholic, and Lieutenant Clark B. Poli, Dutch Reformed. Quickly and quietly, the four chaplains spread out among the soldiers. Then they tried to calm the frightened, tend the wounded, and guide the disoriented toward safety. Witnesses of that terrible night remember hearing the four men offer prayer for the dying and encouragement for those who would live. Said, Why are Fox? Son of Reverend Fox. What well, with this private William B. Bedard found himself floating in oil smeared water, surrounded by dead bodies and debris. I could hear men crying, pleading, praying, Bedard recalls. I could also hear the chaplains preaching courage. Their voices were the only thing that kept me going. Another sailor and petty officer, John J. Mahoney, tried to react to his cabin, but was stopped by Rabbi Good. Mahoney, concerned about the cold Arctic air, explained he had forgotten his gloves. Never mind, good respond, I have two pairs. The rabbi gave the petty officer his own gloves. In retrospect, Mahoney realized that Rabbi Good was not conveniently carrying two pairs of gloves, that the rabbi had decided not to leave the Dorchester. By this time, the men were topside, and the chaplains opened a storage locker and began distributing life jackets. It was then that engineer Grady Clark witnessed an astonishing sight. When there were no more white jackets in the storage room, the chaplains removed theirs and gave them to four frightened young men. It was the finest thing I'd ever seen or hoped to see this side of heaven, said John Ladd, another survivor who saw the chaplain's selfless act. Ladd's response is understandable. The altruistic action of the four chaplains constitute one of the purest spiritual and ethical acts a person can make. When giving their life jackets, Rabbi Good not call out for a Jew, while Pauline did not call out for a Catholic, nor did Reverend Fox and Poland call out for a Protestant, they simply gave their life jackets to the next man in line. As the ship went down, survivors there by rafts could see the four chaplains, arms linked, braced against the slanting deck. Their voices could be heard offering prayers. Of the 902 men aboard the U.S. 18 Dorchester, 672 died, leaving 230 survivors. When news reached American shores, the nation was stunned by the magnitude of the tragedy and the heroic conduct of the four chaplains. That night, Reverend Fox, Rabbi Good, Reverend Poli, and Father Washington passed life's ultimate test. <clears throat> In doing so, they became an enduring, an enduring example of extraordinary faith, courage, and selflessness. 
Did the city share its cost? And Purple Heart was awarded posthumously December 19, 1944. The next of kin, by Lieutenant General Graham B. Somerville, Commanding General of Army Service Forces, at a, center, at a ceremony at the Post Chapel at Fort Myer, Virginia. A posthumous service medal of heroism, never before given and never to be given again, was authorized by Congress and awarded by the President January 18, 1961. Congress wished to confer the Medal of Honor, but was blocked by stringent requirements which required heroism and heroism performed under fire. A special medal was attended at the same way in her importance as the Medal of Honor. And as a chaplain, and as uh, the other chaplains that are here, we are proud to be part of that chaplain court.